scientific. Well, so it is because our science, Greek science, is based on objectivization, whereby it has cut itself off from an adequate understanding of the subjective cognizance of the mind. But I do not believe that this is precisely the point where our present way of thinking does not need does need to be amended, perhaps by a bit of blood transfusion from Eastern thought. He's advocating we've cut off an element of potential understanding the whole reality by getting mind out of the picture. But the Eastern thought says the big picture also includes mind. Now this is Erwin Schrödinger. This is one of the quantum physicists. He says it won't hurt, and perhaps it may help, to at least understand the Western side of things. He's not getting new agey, guru, voodoo, mystical. For someone to label Erwin Schrödinger as a new ager would be palpably idiotic. And yet he's proclaiming it's time we begin bringing in the Eastern side of the world also. Perhaps as a way of explaining some incongruities that we find in our Western type of thinking in our sciences. This is not advocating religion. This is advocating a different world view. This is something I think most people misunderstand. On page 138 he says, Let me briefly mention the notorious atheism of science, which comes, of course, under the same heading. Science has to suffer this reproach again and again, but this is not unjust. I mean, this is unjust. This is not a fair approach to science. Science as a whole is not atheistic, is what he's saying. No personal god can form part of a world model that has only become accessible at the cost of removing everything personal from it. We know when God is experienced, this is an event as real as an immediate sense perception or as one's own personality. Like them, he must be missing in the space-time picture. I do not find God anywhere in space and time. That is what the honest naturalist tells you. For this he incurs blame from him in whose catechism is written, God is spirit. In other words, the idea of bringing God into the picture in the Western view is simply ludicrous. Well, not necessarily ludicrous, but it's not science. But the Eastern view says, perhaps God is part of the equation, whatever God is. I'm not advocating that yet. I'm simply letting you know there's a serious foundational father in quantum physics who had these ideas and views and possible concepts to say, look, our knowledge, our understanding is incomplete. We obviously don't get it all. Maybe we need to include the eastern side of things. This is not an advocation of mysticism. Please do not misunderstand me. I am not saying Erwin Schrödinger all of a sudden opened the door so that everybody could give all of their own mystical interpretations. That's not what he's doing. He's saying Western science has deliberately cut itself off from one aspect of reality that is with us, and that is the mind. And the Eastern side doesn't do that maybe we need to take a closer look. And there have been some very serious scientists who are doing just that, which I will get to, probably in the next podcast. I have enough material here to make four or five podcasts. I very well may. In his chapter 5, Science and Religion, in his book, Mind and Matter, he asks, what is it about Plato that is so enduring We know he didn't make any special discovery about numbers or geometric figures. Some of his philosophy was was done better by others, especially in the natural world. Aristotle, for instance. So what made his fame? In my opinion, it was this, that he was the first to envisage the idea of timeless existence and to emphasize it against reason as a reality more real than our actual experience. This, he said, is but a shadow of the former from which all experienced reality is borrowed. This experience, this idea of the realm of the ideas, 
sprang, as I believe, from a very real experience, namely that he was struck with admiration and awe by the revelations in the realm of numbers and geometrical figures. He recognized and absorbed deeply into his mind the nature of these revelations, that they unfold themselves by pure logical reasoning, which makes us acquainted with true relations, whose truth is not only unassailable, but is obviously there forever. The relations held and will hold, irrespective of our inquiry into them. A mathematical truth is timeless. It does not come into being when we discover it, yet its discovery is a very real event. It may be an emotion like a great gift from a fairy. It's an interesting analysis of Plato. Plato, against all reason, stuck to his guns on what he believed some truths were showing via mathematics. And it was based on an eternal world. He discusses Kant on page 144, Manuel Kant. He taught the ideality of space and time, and this was a fundamental, if not the most fundamental part of his teaching. Like most of his teaching, however, it cannot be verified nor falsified, but it does not lose interest on this account. Instead, and he notes this parenthetically, he says, rather it gains interest because it is neither falsifiable nor provable. If it could be proved or disproved, it would become trivial. The meaning is that to be spread out in space and to happen in a well-defined temporal order of before and after is not a quality of the world that we perceive, but pertains to the perceiving mind, which in its present situation anyhow cannot help registering anything that is offered to it according to these two card indexes, space and time. This is very interesting because the idea of prove or disprove trivializes everything. That's what makes this subject so fun. We have some information, some observations, some facts we have to discuss about quantum physics, not in the manner of proving or disproving, but realizing that even the greatest quantum physicists in our day still are not coming to a unification of what it all means. And that's a good thing because it's generating discussion and based on the quantum physics discussion, there are spin-offs of new ideas, new collaboration of different types of philosophies, and then it's generating ever further different, deep, broad, sometimes contradictory discussions and ideas as we try to reassess our own religions, our own beliefs, our own disbeliefs, and it's as if it's a spreading out of concentric rings of ideas in a great big pond. The sea of potentiality is how the universe is being described now, very interestingly. Well, because of some of the criticisms that I've received on my quantum podcasts, because people are misunderstanding what I'm trying to do here, someone mentioned Leonard Suskind to me. And he said, uh, have you read Leonard Susskind? Well, I went and got his Cosmic Landscape, String Theory, and the Illusion of Intelligent Design. This book is Back Bay Books. It was published in 2006. Brand new. Susskind is one of the original discoverers of String Theory. And he is a phenomenal cosmologist. That is, how did the universe come to be? And is this universe all there is? Susskind's revelation that there is a landscape of multiple universes is positively amazing. Very, very fun read to, to get through this book. I would highly recommend him. Not that he's confirming Mormonism in any way, shape, or form. He's certainly against the idea of a God having formed all these universes. But he has opened up the door to infinite universes. To a megaverse. And our universe being